Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Lim. I'm the Director for Pediatric Emergency Medicine for the Mount Sinai Health System. Uh, and I am the Medical Director here at Mount Sinai Beth Israel in the Pediatric Emergency Department and Short Stay Unit. Hi, I'm Dr. Sana Batty. I'm a child psychiatrist. I'm the Medical Director of the Outpatient Child Psychiatry Department at Mount Sinai Morningside. So how common is it for kids to be afraid of needles, Dr. Lim? Um, you know, it's it's really quite common for, for kids to have some fear of needles. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it certainly is, is something that we see often. Uh, and so certainly don't be uh, concerned if, if your child is. I think you're, you're, you're in really good company in that. How can I talk to my child who is afraid of needles? Yeah, I, I think um, as a parent, you know your child best. So, you know, with, with regards to discussing uh, needles, if you find that your child um, it would benefit from having a discussion the day before or two or leading up to the vaccine appointment, certainly that is a, um, a, a great time to do that. Um, oftentimes you can uh, talk about what you might see or what you might expect. Um, you can even do a little bit of what we call therapeutic play and, you know, use your toys and stuffed animals in order to demonstrate some of those things. Um, there are some great resources out there called Social Stories. Um, if you look those up, it actually gives almost like a comic book like version of what a visit would look like as well. And sometimes some kids um, take really well to, to that as well. Um, so it really is, these are some great resources that you can use with your kids uh, um, uh, with discussions. I would just add that kids really like kind of knowing what's coming. Um, as much as you can prepare them, they'll do better. So absolutely talking to them about even minute details about what it's going to be like traveling to get it, what it's going to be like when you get there, um, what you might even do after. These are ways to kind of subside some of the anxiety they might be having about the actual shot itself. What about bringing something to distract my child? Um, of course, you know, you always want to uh, um, check ahead with where you're, you're getting your, your vaccine if there's anything um, that they might um, 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 be hesitant against you bringing. But in general, stuffed animals, their favorite toy, a squeezy something is, is, is great if they'd like to bring it. Um, uh, you know, certainly if, if you are okay with screens and distractions of that sort, um, you can bring those, just make sure that they're fully charged um, and, and uh, make sure that if you need to like hook up to signal that you have that uh, uh, Wi-Fi available as well. Um, so I think those are all sort of great things that you can bring as, as, as good distractors. So what about any other techniques such as relaxing techniques or deep breathing? Yeah, it depends again on the age of the child. Um, oftentimes, you know, for older children, you can, you know, go through and 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 do some like almost meditative breathing or or um, uh, uh, directed visualization, which are some techniques uh, that that may be available. Um, but for younger kids, really, it's kind of just very very much sort of um, take a deep breath in when you feel that you know when they when they give you the shot, you can breathe out. That's probably the most most common thing that we'll do. Um, but but again, it depends on the age of your child. Um, what about medications? Uh, you know, there are some medications that, that are generally designed to uh, numb the area that you're going to get the shot. I'll say, um, you know, along with that, the other non-pharmacologic thing that you can think about is bringing an ice pack. Um, if you use that in the area, that can certainly um, give you a little bit of numbing uh, to, to make that uh, um, experience a little bit better. Um, again, make that part of your, your, your packing process as well. Um, if you uh, would like, you can speak to your pediatrician. There's a, a cream called Emla that you can apply to the skin. It takes about an hour to kick in. So oftentimes you'll get a prescription for it along with like a special like dressing. You put it on when you're at home getting ready to go. Uh, and then by the time you've queued up and are ready for it, they'll take that cream off uh, and it offers a, a good amount of anesthesia for, um, for the skin. Is it okay to take over-the-counter pain relievers? After you've gotten the vaccine, um, if you're having some soreness at your arm or having you know, fevers or body aches, um, which sometimes do, do occur after vaccinations, giving Motrin or Tylenol after that to your child to make them more comfortable is, is totally fair game. How is Mount Sinai helping to make the vaccination process easier for young kids? We are so excited to start vaccinating our five to 11 year olds. Uh, you know, we, along with your teachers and your parents, 
um, have really been looking forward to this and what it can do for, you know, for, for our children and, and, you know, getting back to uh, a new normal. Um, and so we have created um, really family centered and child friendly vaccination pods um, at our sites uptown at Mount Sinai um, Kravis Children's Hospital, as well as downtown at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, um, and carved out special clinics just for children um, with, you know, family friendly design, uh, child life specialists, music therapy specialists, and, and really wanting to make sure that the experience is a positive one for you and your child. What should I do if I have more questions? I think, uh, you know, certainly speaking to your pediatrician um, is a great first step. Uh, again, we have been looking forward to this for, for a while uh, and uh, are really prepared to, to talk and walk through um, the, the process for you and your child um, with not just this vaccine, but really all vaccines. So what causes needle phobia? So needle phobia, it actually has its own name. It's called trypanophobia, and it's actually more common than people think. Uh, we don't have exact numbers. They don't really have a good way of assessing this, but um, it's, you know, at one point was believed to be like 20 to 60% of populations. It tends to be more common in younger uh, age patients and women for some reason, but as to what actually makes someone more likely to have it, we really don't know. It, it seems to be something that's more related to kind of this innate feeling that you have this fear rather than maybe due to like a specific bad event that happened once that made you kind of predisposed. So it's just one of those things that people just tend to have. You are at a higher risk if you have like a biological family member who also has needle phobia. So those are the things we do know about it. There's still a lot we don't. And then I'd say, you know, amongst children, the groups that we tend to see um, uh, uh, some more needle phobia with um, are, are often children that have chronic illnesses uh, and as a result of that are often, you know, either in and out of hospitals or at least see doctors um, frequently and they may be subject to, you know, more frequent um, uh, uh, sticks. Uh, and then, you know, uh, children that have suffered from, you know, significant traumas or, or hospitalizations uh, in a, a long similar sort of like line as well. So we're, we're, we're um, mindful of, of, of those things as we sort of talk about vaccinations. So how has fear about COVID manifested in children and, how, and does that affect vaccine um, hesitancy? So fear about COVID really is dependent on a child's age and developmental level. Um, you know, we know that at different ages and stages, they have different perceptions of illness and disease. And so, you know, for younger kids, they maybe can understand the germ model, um, you know, the really younger, like preschool age children and on. And then as they get older and become school age to adolescence, they can have more of an understanding of you know, the actual complexities of disease and catching it and what, you know, long-term effects can be. So depending on the kids' um, developmental levels, you know, we've seen different levels of fear. Um, some kids, it's really activated a lot of worries about contamination, um, fear about their loved ones getting ill. Um, for younger kids, they might actually not be as worried about the day-to-day, -day, but they're noticing how it is affecting their, um, their structure and their play dates and their schools. So, uh, you know, it's manifesting differently in them. Yeah, and, and I think to, to that, if, if there's maybe a little bit of a silver lining in um, this first couple of days of, of vaccination, what we've seen a lot of it actually is some really positive attitudes about vaccination. Um, it, you know, uh, and I think this speaks a lot to how much your kids will read your, you know, um, perceptions and your body language and your anxieties about vaccines. Um, what we've seen is a lot of kids really excited to get their COVID vaccine because they saw their parents get it. They saw their big siblings get it. And maybe their big siblings got to go to camp over the summer or didn't have to quarantine um, when there was a case. So, you know, for many kids, um, uh, we are seeing some, you know, at least positive uh, uh, vaccine perceptions uh, because of that. So how can I help my child be more comfortable with the vaccine? So kids really like preparation, structure, knowing what's coming. So, you know, talking to them about why we're getting vaccines, what the purpose of them is, how it's going to happen, um, you know, 
how they even work if they're old enough to understand that conceptually. These are all ways that they can feel prepared and feel like they're taking some agency in this. Obviously, they're going to pick up on your cues as well if you're the parent. So it's important that, you know, you're giving them accurate information. You're also kind of coming from a place of some confidence in this process and, and you know, assuring them uh, they will pick up on that and feel more prepared. How is the pandemic affecting children and families? What has been the psychological and developmental impact? So... The pandemic has affected routines, it's affected schooling, it's affected um, one's ability to participate in normal life events, birthdays, um, even unfortunately deaths, lots of areas that you know we take for granted that has really affected uh, our children who have like a you know smaller uh, timeline of, of these instances. So you know I think it's really affected them. And at the same time, we've seen that they've been really resilient. Um, you know, being back in person in school, I've been just kind of marveling how well so many of the children have done, you know, without this structure in their life and, and how eager and happy they are to be back. You know, I, I think that it is um, certainly something that we'll be looking at and, and, and observing and studying for years to come. Um, you know, some of the few things that we do know is, you know, there's likely a three to five month educational lag that we've had from these various, you know, um, shutdowns, quarantines, and et cetera. And we'll be, you know, spending some time catching up with that. Um, there were actually some, you know, students that were struggling um, prior that actually did better during remote schools. And we learned from that uh, as well. Uh, and hopefully we'll find ways to um, approach that in the future to benefit all kids and, and all learners. Um, so, you know, I, I think the impact has been different on different people um, and we'll continue to look at that. So, you know, I think psychologically children have definitely um, dealt with differences in how they see themselves, how they see their family units. Um, and that has changed as, you know, in some instances they become closer to their family units and in some instances um, having a lot of time together has been difficult for them and they can't wait to kind of get back to some of their um, socializing. So developmentally as well, like uh, we have touched upon, education has been affected and socialization as well. Some kids are lagging a bit at some social skills, um, at some education like areas where we would expect them to be, they might be a couple of months behind. So these are some areas that we know of some delays and perhaps some difficulties, but it, it's still you know something we have to monitor and watch. How will getting the vaccine help children and families get back to normal? I think it actually is really exciting in the sense that it allows kids to feel like they're doing their part. It gives them some agency. It gives them some role to play in this where they've really kind of just been sitting back and, and having things decided for them. So I think getting them interested and excited about it is going to be really helpful um, getting them to a get the vaccine and then also kind of share with their friends and their loved ones that they did their part. Um, you know, feeling like they're part of the conversation is going to really help increase the amount of vaccines kids get. And then, you know, that's going to help all of us in the long run. Yeah, I, I kind of, again, sometimes challenge the word what no, normal means, because I think it will be a little bit different now um, than what uh, we came upon before the pandemic. Um, I have a seven-year-old, so that cohort of children has never seen a normal school year. So his school year, kindergarten grade stopped in March. And then all of last year was some part of like hybrid and remote uh, and in-person. And now this year is much more in-person, but there are still masks, there are still quarantines and those things. And on the practical matter, you know, vaccinated kids uh, no longer have to exercise quarantine if there are cases in school. So we will immediately sort of cut down on, um, on missing out on school because of cases. There will be fewer cases in general period because more children will be vaccinated. So I think we'll start bringing together a little bit more of uh, what we would see as, as, as a, a typical um, a childhood uh, school experience. You know, we'll get back to field trips and sleepovers and all of those sorts of things as time goes on. Um, but, but I really do like, you know, it's not what you said about making them part of that solution and giving them that, 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 um, that role. And I think they really will glom onto it. 